Well, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having oh. us. <laughs> so, so we've got two people on today rather than um, we've got three technically, I suppose I'm here as well. So I'll let Rachel and Matt just introduce themselves. If you want to say your role first, Rachel, and, and what you do. Yeah, so I'm Scotland Director um, for Wild Fish. So I work on all of our conservation work across Scotland, um, most specifically focusing on salmon farming campaigning. Yeah, and I'm Matt, I'm the Farm Salmon Campaign Manager for, for Wild Fish. So um, the majority of my, all, all of my work is, is focused around salmon farming and the impacts on wild fish. Up in Scotland, um, more recently, we've been working on our Off the Table campaign. Yeah, and we're gonna we will get onto off the table um during this podcast. Um so I guess for a lot of people they might not realise how extensive salmon farm or it sounds very innocent, salmon farming, but it's perhaps not so innocent. So I thought if we maybe talk a little bit about um what goes on with open net salmon farming, because am I am I right in saying that it's more open net salmon farming that's the issue? Yes, yeah, so um, I guess sort of to, to bring it back to, to salmon farming as a whole, there, there's um, like to, to talk around open net salmon farming, there's there's two stages to, to production of a of, of farm salmon. There's the initial freshwater stage, so that's from egg to, to small, so a, a young juvenile fish. Uh, and that stage is is done or, or, or it undergoes um, a freshwater stage. So that's in in tanks and, and largely based land systems, but can be an open net as well. The um, the term sort of open net salmon farming largely relates to the the second half of the production, so the the half of the production that that is um, uh, undergone in in uh, along the coasts of. West Scotland and Ireland, so in marine in the marine system, and these are, um, are big nets, so they're effective like almost like semicircles that that sit um, along the coast of, of Scotland, and and hold the salmon. So the open net salmon farm uh, farming sort of term uh, is effectively cages um, produced or, or made of nets that allow sort of free movement of of water in and out of them, and obviously holds the the farm salmon. And to your point on the industry. Um, yes, potentially it sounds like quite a quaint industry, but it is a multi, multi-million pound industry um, that operates internationally. So um, salmon farming started in Scotland in the 1970s, um, the majority of which were kind of small companies or like it was kind of a cottaging industry. But since then, particularly in the 90s, the 80s and 90s, we saw this big co consolidation of farms into these huge international companies that we see dominating the market today. So I think... I think I'm right in saying pretty much all salmon farming companies in Scotland are internationally owned now right. by just a handful of companies. So that's comparative. I didn't know that it started in the 70s. So comparatively recently then, not not that long ago. So, yeah. so it's an incredibly young and, and, and new livestock industry, absolutely. But one that has seen a, a you know a huge expansion in Scotland to where you know the current um, sort of production levels are sitting around sort of uh, two hundred thousand tons of, of of farm salmon a year, so it's 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 a it's a huge business. I I read on the Wild Fish uh, website it contributes four hundred and fifty million pounds to Scotland's economy. So it's huge money, isn't it? Big money industry. It's big money, definitely. How much specifically is contributed to the Scottish economy is always debatable but I think ah, there's okay. no <laughs> you can't debate the fact that it, it is a hugely profitable industry and that is why you know why it's such an interest such a popular industry I think because it is such a big money-making industry for sure for sure and, and Matt you mentioned earlier about the they keep the, the juveniles in tanks so I mean I'm, I'm a bit naive so why why can't we keep adults in tanks? What's the reason that we have them in, in open nets in the first place then? Or whoever's better, or yeah. if Rachel knows better, whoever, whoever's best to answer that. <laughs> no, no, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, certainly the, it, a lot of it comes to logistics and, and costs. Um, right. So uh, the, obviously the, as the fish grow, so in those initial stages from, from egg to small, it's largely growing fish up to probably around sort of 100 grams. The, the marine phase is growing fish to around five kilos. So they're, they're mu mu much larger cages um, and would therefore require much larger systems or, or tank-based systems. So there certainly is a, a financial element to it. 
Um, that's not to say that those recirculation or, or sort of land-based tank systems aren't um, out there. So they're in their sort of infancy. Um, but certainly, you know, we're starting to see land-based systems in, in other countries. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, they, they obviously require sort of cooling of the water and treatment of the water. So the water is effectively recirculated around the system. Um, so, you know, there's issues with that. There's much more or much larger in, input requirements compared to sort of the open net system. So it's effectively the way that it's all the, the industry has always sort of operated with these large cages out on, on, on the west coast of Scotland in, in our country, but obviously across the, the globe, it's, it's the way that salmon farming in the majority is, 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 is done. And so the is issue it... you have with that, Sorry, Rachel, with, just to say the issue that you have obviously with these open net cages is that there is this free flowing of water from the cages into the surrounding environment. And I think that as an organization is what we're really concerned with. So looking at both the spread of parasites from the farms, but also the chemicals used um, and the waste uh, waste waste uh, effluent from the farms just going directly into the surrounding environment. So is it a case then that it would be better in 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 freshwater or contained tanks or does or is that just different issues like you're swapping one problem for another it's i say it's not something so, i know a great deal about so just due, due to the very life cycle of of, of salmon there, there will always be a need for a saltwater phase right obviously okay. that phase can be undergone in a tank-based system or a land-based system um, so, you know, there, there is potential to, to move towards those sort of um, uh, production systems. That's not to say that they're not without their issues. So they do have their benefits of, of being a physical barrier between wild fish and the farm fish. So of course, that has benefits from a disease perspective, escapee uh, perspective. So, you know, we do see <clears throat> the farm time and can escape from these nets because, you know, they're, they're sort of plastic or, or nylon based nets. Um, you know, when we get escapees coming from the farms, they can breed with our wild salmon and, and, and cause genetic issues there. So the physical barrier that we can, uh, it, you know, is, is certainly a benefit to, to wild fish and to the to the environment because, you know, there can be waste management, etc. However, that's not to say that, that those tank based systems are without their issues. So for them to be economically viable, the stocking densities have to be much higher for the farm. And also there's welfare implications with that. They do also need a huge energy requirement to circulate and to cool water. And obviously they, they, they require water. So there's a degree of abstraction as well. So, you know, there, there's still issues with that system, but from an environmental perspective, they can be much better for, for the local environment, for sure. I think we definitely see, and we can come on to this again when we talk about off the table, but within the recommendations for our off the table campaign, we see closed containment as an option to explore as a potential alternative to open net salmon farming, but it has to be addressed within the context of wider sustainability issues. And, you know, generally, the system that we're working in making that more sustainable. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So if I mean, you've already mentioned a few of the, the problems there, then but if we're talking about some of the issues that open net salmon farming causes then uh, what what are we looking like so you've mentioned i mean i suppose sea lice is one that a lot of people will know about so what's the issue with salmon farms and sea lice yeah so i i guess to sort of bring it back to to, to the issues around it and, and and certainly sea lice is one of those there's three main issues that that um, we campaign around and our off the table campaign aims to highlight and that is the environmental sustainability and welfare issues so Environmentally, sea lice is, is a huge issue. So um, uh, sea lice are an external parasite that um, uh, naturally occur in the environment. The, um, the lice themselves attach to, to, to the fish and feed on the, the mucus, skin and, and blood of the fish. In the intensive um, systems of, of open net pens where, you know, walk these cages along the West Coast where there can be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of fish, and, you know, on individual sites. The parasites can build up to, to huge numbers thereafter spreading, you know, through those nets back into the surrounding environment um, and attaching to, to wild fish. And, and specifically, that's um, uh, wild uh, Atlantic salmon smolts and sea trout that are coming from the rivers into the marine environment where those fish are uh, sort of migrating past the, those farms and, and through, you know, clouds of, of, of lice, they can pick up the lice and, and, and just litter the sort of two lice can be potentially fatal for, for a um, Atlantic salmon smolt, for instance. So, you know, there's a risk of, of uh, you know, or certainly that there's a, a negative impact to, to the populations of our wild salmonids 
that are directly coming from the farms and specifically from the parasites of these farms. So it's something that's very difficult for, for the industry con to control by the very nature of these open nets that allow the, the movement of parasites in and out of these farms. The other element to the, the environmental aspects of the salmon farming, is, is, as Rachel touched on previously, is that the very nature of the, 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 the open net cages means that uh, the fish waste, so that can be the fish poo, um, uneaten food or other organic material can, you know, simply fall out of the nets. Um, and there's estimates that, that the, the, the fish sort of waste alone is equivalent to the sewage population of, of half of Scotland. And this is you know, going into our lock and coastal systems untreated. So it, it's a huge impact on that local environment. Um, uh, you know, likewise, the chemicals that are used on the farms have a big impact as well. And I can come back to that because that's a, a sort of whole thing in itself. So you get, you know, getting the like algal blooms and things like that. Yeah. So um, you know, uh, certainly the there are increasing issues around algal blooms affecting um, the, the farms uh, along the, the Scottish coast and, and islands. You know, the an increase in organic material coming from those farms. You know, has certainly the potential to to, to cause these, if not worse than these, as well. So it's definitely something that that um, you know the, the industry seems to be suffering from from a mortality perspective. So. The local environmental impacts are, are huge. Um, the, the obviously the sort of second of the three main subjects that we 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 look at are sustainability or is sustainability and and a real big one around that is is looking at the input of a fish into these farms. So obviously uh, Atlantic salmon uh, Atlantic salmon are fundamentally carnivores. So you know, that does mean that they require a, a, a certain amount of, of fish within their diet. And, you know, in the uh, in the industry, this requires fish meal, fish oil. So this is ground down fish to produce the protein and the, the oil itself. There's lots of different estimates out there as to, to how much this requires. But fundamentally, um, salmon farming is a, is a net consumer of wild caught fish. So uh, as a recent paper suggested that or, or uh, found that it, it took approximately two and a half kilos of wild caught fish to produce a kilo of salmon. So these are fish that are obviously coming from reduction fisheries, so the big trawlers, et cetera, catching sort of lower trophic levels of fish like sardines, herring, mackerel, all of which, or 90% of, of which could be consumed um, directly by humans or instead being fed to the fish themselves. It, it's probably an area that Rachel might might be able to chat about a little bit more with her, her, her previous work history than, than I can. So feel free to jump in if if, if I've missed anything, Rachel. No, no, you've covered it. Um, yeah, just to add, like, these reduction fisheries where the salmon industry is sourcing its um, fish meal and fish oil, you know, they're off the coast of Peru, they're off the coast of West Africa, so it's it's often countries in the global south where actually, you know, it's diverting essential protein from those populations as well. So there are kind of, the way I see it, it's almost issues upon issues within salmon farming and as Matt outlined we're looking at you know the environmental and the welfare and sustainability issues but they all feed into each other so for instance Matt mentions the algal blooms well algal blooms lead to huge mortalities on the farms and that's obviously a welfare issue so actually the way you know at wild fish we're concerned with preserving wild fish populations and their habitats and the environmental impacts but you actually can't really look at that without also looking at these related sustainability welfare issues because they all feed into one it's sort of like a it's not a linear line of issues it's a spider web it seems to just go you hit one thing and then that splits out into three things that are an issue and then you go to those and it's just it's on and on and on isn't it and i think that's the issue with this for fundamentally unsustainable industry is that in trying to tackle one issue say for instance sea lice that means necessitates that the industry is then using, say, chemicals to try and do that. And that has a negative impact on the environment or they're trying to use different types of treatments that don't use chemicals, but actually do impact on the welfare of the fish. So I think you're absolutely right in that this kind of like Pac-Man style, you know, mm. you hit one issue and it, it migrates into three different issues, um, which is why we see it as a fundamentally unsustainable industry. Do you want to... Tell us a little bit more about off the table then, because we've mentioned it a few times. So we might as well talk about it now. So what is off the table? Yeah, so off the table um, is a, a new campaign that Wild Fish are leading. So it's a coalition campaign, which means that we've brought together um, a number of other charities, NGOs and community groups 
um, with the view of highlighting the environmental sustainability and welfare issues that, that you know we've just discussed and, and I'm sure we'll go on to discuss further around open net salmon farming in the UK within the context of um, uh, the ongoing use of, of farm salmon in the hospitality sector. So what we're doing is we're working with chefs, restaurants um, uh, and different individuals within the hospitality sector and different businesses within that sector to um, take farm salmon off the menu. Um, and to, to start to promote more sustainable alternatives. So we're using the, the expertise and brilliance of the different chefs and restaurants that we're working with to say, uh, to, you know, to highlight the issues to, to the general public around farm salmon and consuming farm salmon and actually say, hey, look, these alternatives exist. Let's explore those. Um, uh, and with that, you know, we can then, um, uh, you know, promote more sustainable food models as well. What's the what's the uptake been like? Have you had a lot of interest from restaurants and groups wanting to kind of get on board with this, or are they like head in the sand? I think I, it's. I think it's, it's, oh, sorry, Matt. Go on, Rachel. Go on. I was going to say I think it's always a kind of patchwork of you know no hospitality. They're all different restaurants and chefs and having different interests and things. But I think what I've been heartened by is actually how receptive chefs have been to the issue. I think we've had a really good response rate so far. We've been able to kind of publicly name um, just a handful of chefs, but there are lots more in the pipeline and we're currently working on putting together a directory so we can signpost uh, visitors to the microsite to these um, establishments that aren't serving farmed salmon. I think something I found really interesting is actually a lot of chefs are aware of the issues around farmed salmon anyway and potentially already had made that decision to step away from it. So really part of our work is also identifying those chefs and kind of linking them into potentially a bigger movement that they a part of potentially hadn't realized yeah yeah for sure if people want to because presumably this is an open thing if people want to get involved with it then they just go to the, the wild fish website if they want to kind of jump on board with off the table so we actually have a separate um campaign website so you can access it from the wild fish site which is okay. wildfish.org but you also can go straight to um off the table.org.uk and that right. will have options for both, you know, consumers or um, customers who want to get involved and businesses as well. OK, I'll put a link to it in the description if people want to okay. check that out and see a, a little bit more information about that. Um, you mentioned chemicals earlier, Matt. So mm -hmm. why, why is that an issue? Obviously, if they, because of, uh, presumably most of the animals that we uh, I should also point out, Matt used to be a, a well, you still are. I say used to be you still are a vet. And you have worked on salmon farms. So this is all first hand for you, isn't it? Like this is a case that you've literally worked on salmon farms as a vet. Um, why why are chemicals an issue then? Presumably we we treat a lot of the animals that we eat. So why is it such an issue with, with salmon? Yeah, so so the very sort of unique thing about salmon farming is as we sort of keep touching on is is you know that it's um it's direct communication with the surrounding environment. So when chemicals are used on the farm, those chemical or on the site or within a cage, those farm uh, those chemicals are then directly um, discharged into the surrounding environment. So there's a few different ways uh, and, and a few different sort of um, uh, conditions that are you know frequently treated on some farms. Sea lice being the probably the largest and most frequently treated one. Within that, there's a few different sort of chemicals that are used. So there are bath treatments, and, and effectively this involves um, putting a huge tarpaulin around the, the cage or lifting the cage up a little bit to reduce the, the amount of sort of water um, or, or sort of volume of the actual cage itself, and then completely enclosing the cage in a tarpaulin so it's a sort of sealed unit with the fish inside. Uh, various different chemicals are then added to that, and the fish are bathed in those chemicals. So you know common ones include hydrogen peroxide um so you know often that people think about the the sort of chemical that's used to bleach your hair you know that, that's effectively it but hydrogen peroxide at a low low dose um we've also got insecticides or pesticides as well and and these are, you know uh, again are commonly used for sea lice the big issue around those and, and certainly with the latter is once that tarpaulin is removed that chemical those chemicals then directly discharge into the surrounding environment and by their very nature, because, you know, certainly the pesticides target the sea lice, they're, they're also 
toxic or, or, or highly damaging for other marine life, specifically things like crabs, lobsters, crustaceans, and that can be as far as sort of 40 kilometers from the farm. So it's not just localized to a really small area around the cage. It can be a huge distance from the farm that, that, that we can see toxic effects on, on you know, our, our vital marine life, you know, specifically crustaceans in that case as well. Um, that's not to say that doesn't just happen in those open net cages. We see it in the, the freshwater stages that we were chatting about earlier as well. And, and another sort of commonly used um, chemical in the salmon farming industry is, is formaldehyde. So the chemical that's used to embalm people. <clears throat> and that's a, a common chemical that, that's used to, to treat um, fungal infections in, in the freshwater stages. Again, once it's used, um, it's released into the environment and again that's a, a you know toxic to 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 marine life or aquatic life sorry it, it's also a, a carcinogenic so it's a really nasty chemical that all chemicals that being discharged directly into the environment that have a, a, a localized impact so it's a huge concern in that respect i think the other concern around chemical use and and really um sets apart uh, salmon farming from, from other livestock industries is the increase in use of antibiotic use as well. So, um, you know, by the very nature of uh, an intensive fam uh, farming industry, we, uh, you know, there, there are instances or large instances of, of, of bacterial conditions, you know, for which um, uh, antibiotics are, are required. Um, we uh, there was a, a recent report um, released by the, the government uh, to look at the antibiotic use in, in livestock industries across the UK in 2021, um, and salmon farming was the, the only industry to show increasing use of antibiotics, um, whereas there, there was a, a decrease in all those other industries. And, and really what that equated to is 8.9 tonnes of antibiotics going into to the, to the salmon farms in the form of, um, uh, you know, salmon feed laced with, with antibiotics, some of which, you know, can go potentially fall into the surrounding environment with any antibiotic use, especially an increasing volume of antibiotic use. There is a risk of antimicrobial resistance, which, you know, is, is a really serious issue for the human population as well as the livestock population. Uh, you know, any use of antibiotics, especially increasing one, has the potential to to increase the, the amount of resistance that's out there. And, and that can have a, or, or is already having a direct impact on, on human health and, and the conditions that, that we can treat in individuals with, with, with bacterial conditions. So the chemical use within, within the summer farming industry is, is, is a real issue, both for the local environment as a, a sort of one health or a planet health perspective. Um, and for the fish themselves, so you know the the being bathed in in a a, a chemical like hydrogen peroxide or, or formaldehyde, it, it's not a, a, a it's not a pleasant thing to experience or witness. Um, uh, you know, we can say that per the latter personally. The there's a very fine line for some of these chemicals between uh, you know a, a therapeutic range and a range that, that then becomes damaging to the fish. So you can you can see gill health you know gill health issues or you know, cause the like irritation to the gills or, or damage to the gills with that. So there's a welfare issue involved there. There's an environmental issue involved there and sustainability. So again, it comes to this, you know, web of, of, of issues around the, the actual conditions themselves affecting the fish and the environment and then the treatment methods that, that are used. So chemical use for, you know, from a veterinary perspective and a One Health Planet Health perspective, I think is, is really concerning especially given the, the increase or the expansion of the, the summer farming industry. And just tying that into the Scotland perspective as well, it's really interesting that I feel that this um, impact of chemicals on, say, the local crustacean populations is massively underexplored when it comes to calculating the economic contribution of salmon farming to Scotland. Because obviously, I think all the calculations to date have looked at the net benefit of the industry to Scotland, and they're not necessarily uh, accounting for these negative impacts on other industries that salmon farming is having. Yeah, and, and this is all presumably like there's, there's evidence for all of this. So you would think that the Scottish government would potentially want to act on this, but is it harder to kind of get things done? Unfortunately, the Scottish government is firmly in support of salmon farming um, currently ah, okay. and it actually views it as part of its sustainable economic plan. Um, it somehow ah. views salmon farming as a sustainable industry. Yeah, I was just sort of thinking like they don't normally go together, do they? Salmon farming and sustainable. So it was interesting that they're put together. It's very interesting. And I think that's a big part of our work is to highlight how unsustainable this industry is, because fundamentally if that is what is underpinning Scottish government support that needs to be 
you know, the reality of that needs to be exposed. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you see some of the stuff that Corin Smith has filmed and you get like the the salmon and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll try and put a link to some of it in the description if people haven't, but you see salmon like zombies, their, their flesh mm-hmm. is falling off them and, you know, it, it's horrific. It's that, if the same thing was happening with pigs or cows, people wouldn't stand for it. But because it's a fish that is hard to get people interested in in the first place, but it's a fish out of sight because most salmon farms are generally secretive. They're not opening people with uh, bow farms to come and have a look at their animals generally. So it's, um, it is it is appalling and it's quite distressing really when you see what happens to them. And actually yeah, you're touching on a really interesting issue because, and it's quite timely just now because recent recently released data showed that actually mortalities on Scottish salmon farms doubled last year. So they went from, 8.9 million, which admittedly is still a lot anyway, but to 15 million last year from wow. January to November. And on average, mortalities are one in four fish or 25% on these farms. So as you say, I think by virtue of them being out of sight, out of mind, it's much easier to ignore these huge mortalities than it would be to ignore them within, say, other types of terrestrial farming. That, that's a lot of dead fish to get rid of, presumably. It's, it's huge. It, it is huge, yeah. And obviously, the not only is there a huge welfare, uh, you know, issue around that high level of mortality, it's also the resources that have gone into to to growing the, you know, the fifteen or fifteen million plus fish that are then going to, you know, um, uh, to landfill or to, you know, uh, are being cremated or or into various different sort of waste disposal systems. There's the the millions of, of wild caught fish that are going into that as well. Um, and we haven't know, even 20... accounted for cleaner fish yet as well. That's another... no. I'm going to bring um, I'm going to bring that up in a second. Yeah, I do want to talk about cleaner fish. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, to come back to the mortality rates, the the 25 percent sort of mortality rate is is an average. We you know, looking at the data that's publicly available, we see um, levels much higher than that on a frequent basis. You know, we can get monthly mortality rates of, of, of sort of 75 percent of the fish on a site, um, uh, let alone sort of production mortality rates. So it, it, it's huge numbers of, of fish that are being lost due to the conditions in which they're farmed in, um, you know, the, the various or, um, plethora of different diseases that, that they're exposed to or, or, or die from. So it's a huge issue across the industry. And I think it for me, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the veterinary background, it's, it's one that, um, you know, I have a strong passion to, to want to to highlight that to the general public. So, I, you know, we, we've definitely identified that there is, you know, in that lack of awareness around the, the huge losses that are going on within the salmon farming industry. And I think you're absolutely right. If there was, you know, if we were seeing um, that on a, a terrestrial or land based um, uh, system with, with you know, um, other forms of livestock, it, 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 it people would be um, up in arms about it for sure. Yeah, it, it's quite saddening. Um, Rachel, you touched on cleaner fish. I think now's as good a point to talk about them. So, what is, for people that don't know, like what, what are the cleaner fish and what are their roles in salmon farms? So I think cleaner fish is another good example of this Pac-Man effect that you described earlier, because mm. basically cleaner fish have been increasingly recruited onto salmon farms to act as li- as a form of lice control, because obviously as lice have proliferated on salmon farms over the past years and chemicals use has increased, so too has the resistance to those chemical treatments. And therefore cleaner fish are increasingly being used as an alternative form of sea lice removal. Um, their efficacy is debated. Um, they arguably don't actually do a very good job of removing sea lice, but they're also representative of another huge sustainability issue with the industry because these some of these cleaner fish are actually taken from ecosystems in southern England and transported to farms where they're culled at the end of the production cycle. Whereas in the in the wild, they could live for up to Matt, you're going to correct me on this, 27 years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. For- for, for specific rat species yeah yeah but so they're, they're being taken and, and cold at the end of a production cycle which is 18 months that's just yeah, ridiculous. So, I mean, sorry sorry matt go on no no i uh, just to sort of expand on, on what rachel has already said the the there's sort of two two um uh, main species of, of of clean fish used in the uk there's lump fish and there's ras um uh, so lumpfish are, are solely produced, so they're, they're commercially grown or, or farmed, um, whereas uh, rats, a proportion of those are, are taken from the wild in, in, in uh, live fisheries and then put in the, the, the cages with the salmon. 
Um, and then again, with those, as with the salmon farm, uh, you know, as with the salmon themselves, there's, there's huge mortalities there. So, um, you know, the, we can see mortalities in, in the cleaner fish, both lump fish and the ras of, of up to 100% um, uh, it, during the course of production cycle. Um, they're really sort of prone to changes in the water. So if there's a treatment that's that's going on for the salmon, that can kill all of the, the cleaner fish. Um, you know, and, and as Rachel has already said, the 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 common practice in the summer farming industry is to to cull the, the the cleaner fish at the end of the production cycle, just because of the risk of you know spreading diseases to the next um, uh, you know uh, 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 crop of, of of fish that come into to the cages. So, you know, it's millions of of, of fish a year that are, uh, are being deployed and then culled um, uh, within the, the Scottish summer farming industry alone, let alone globally, where it's, you know, 10, 10, you know, 60 million plus cleaner fish that are being used. I've been on the south coast before, like Dorset, and you'll see people putting out pots for wrasse. And that's what, what's what they, because they're not, you don't eat wrasse generally, they're not very good eating fish, but people are catching these wrasse. And I forget the value, but they're, it's quite good money for something like a lot of these uh, crab fishermen and, and lobster potmen who normally would just t- chuck the wrasse back. They're making good money shipping these wrasse up to Scotland. But I do think quite frankly it's laughable that you can call that sustainable how how is it sustainable taking millions of fish from the wild and then killing them after a year it's just bonkers it's absolutely not to mention these wrasse are also fed with wild caught fish so like it's just layer upon layer upon layer of unsustainable practices it's crazy yeah Yeah. and all Um, those all those wrasse and and lump suckers I mean, you say they're, the lump suckers predominantly farm, but the rats certainly have got important ecological roles Absolutely. around our around our coastline. So removing them, I mean, anecdotally talking to a lot of the fishermen on the south coast, they have seen a, a marked decline in rats numbers. I mean, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, they, they did used to kind of get rats closer to home, but the Scottish rats numbers have plummeted and that's why they've started to look further afield. Is that is that right? There have been stronger controls on on wrasse fisheries in Scotland in the last few years, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. So it is um, it's sickening, really. Sorry, go on, Matt. Yeah, it is. No, I mean they're they're hugely territorial fish as well. So you know, once you once they've been you know caught from a, a, an area, it takes it takes a long time for them to to repopulate. So you know, the, the, there's no doubt that it's having huge ecological impacts where they're being farmed. Um, so it, yeah, it's it's a fundamentally unsustainable and damaging practice for sure that, that is often promoted by the industry as a, a green sort of treatment method for or and you know green sustainable treatment method for sea lice. But the reality is 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 very far from that. And you said it's debatable if they do eat the lice. So what's the evidence then that they're saying right? We put them in and they eat all the lice, or is it just sort of to be seen to be doing something? So, that, so there's lots of conflicting scientific evidence as to how efficient they are in, in terms of, you know, picking the lice off the salmon. So lots of the research around, um, you know, how effective they are has is, is, is been done in sort of um, tank-based systems. So, you know, ones that aren't true to, to the actual deployment in the sea cages. You know, there's again, you know, even um, at a level where that has been done at the, the sea cage level, we're seeing uh, conflicting evidence. So that, that there might be that um, or for some papers or, or for some research pieces, they're often looking at the content of uh, of a cleaner fish's stomach um, to see, you know, how many lice are in there, if any. Sometimes it can be very few. So, uh, you know, it can be um, a, a very small percentage of the population sample that actually contain lice and, and you know indicative of, of actually um, uh, those clean fish working so there's lots of evidence to suggest that it's not as as efficient um, or you know weak evidence to support its efficacy as as, as well in some places yeah because you think they just eat the pellets <laughs> if it's a choice between eating some monkey sea lice off a of salmon or you know fish meal <laughs> pellets the rats aren't stupid they're going to go for the pellet surely yeah, and, and especially when you consider the stress of, you know, coming outside of, of you know, there's, there's sort of hides or, or areas where they can sort of go to um, within the cages that are required um, by regulation. But, you know, to come out and especially as the, the, the salmon get larger because, you know, they, they can be at the side where they can predate, um, uh, you know, smaller fish. It, it's a stressful experience for a ras or, or a lump fish that is, you know, used to, to much more sort of enclosed spaces to, to come out into this big ball of, you know, five kilo plus salmon and, and, and try and pick lice off. So the, the reality of how well they work in, in situ is, is is definitely questionable. So are there any sustainable 
alternatives then? Is there such a thing as sustainable salmon at the moment in the UK? So certainly um, from a wild fish perspective and an off the table perspective, we would say that, uh, or we would urge individuals, so be that the general public or chefs and restaurants to, to not serve or eat farm salmon. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the wild stocks of salmon in, in the UK are um, uh, significantly decreasing. So, you know, both both wild and farmed is, is, is unsustainable, unfortunately. So to answer your question, Jack, no, there, there's not a sustainable source of, of salmon in the UK currently, um, which is, you know, in part why we felt that the Off the Table campaign is, is so important to, to raise that awareness and, and start to explore um, more sustainable alternatives. Um, so it's coming away from that idea of, of, of buying a fillet of salmon or, or, or side of salmon um, and start to explore more sustainable options instead. What so about... our campaign recommendations, just to say, it's kind of, we have three recommendations within the campaign. It's eat less fish, eat lower trophic fish. So that'd be kind of more pelagic fish and then explore alternatives for aquaculture. And one of the alternatives could be closed containment, like we discussed earlier. But obviously, as Matt highlighted, there are significant issues with closed containment that need to be addressed before that could be rolled out. So that's really, I think we're very aware Unfortunately, there's not a one size fits all solution to this problem. And yeah. I think that's probably true of food systems in general. Like nothing will be sustainable if everyone does the same thing. So yeah, I think of course. we're very much hoping to work with chefs through this campaign to develop alternatives. But we're not stipulating what those alternatives have to be, because I think actually it's going to be a bit more of a kind of patchwork effect. Yeah, that makes sense, because I suppose... When you look at Pacific salmon, I, I mean, and, and I'm not an expert on that, but their wild fisheries are more sustained just purely because they have so, so many salmon over there. It's a little bit more sustainable. But then mm -hmm. if you ship Pacific salmon over to the UK, then you've got an atrocious carbon footprint. So yeah, you can't win. Yeah. You can't win. No. Yeah, we're certainly not advocating that everyone switch from farm salmon to wild salmon. No, no, I think no, no. The no. focus of the campaign is farm salmon because that is an industry that yes. we have within the UK, within Scotland. Um, you're right in the wild Alaskan salmon is the last viable um, commercial fishery. Um, but as you say, our recommendations are a bit more kind of like a bit more kind of broad strokes than that, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I think certainly when we can, you know, when we come back to the sustainability aspect of it and, and thinking about the, the wild caught fish or the, you know, two and a half kilos of wild caught fish that's going into a kilo of salmon, what, what we're, you know, what we're highlighting is that actually, um, you know, as a population, we should be focusing on, on the, the, the wild caught fish themselves so that, um, you know, we can reduce pressures on that system. So, you know, we're, we're not promoting a system that, that is a net consumer of that. And, you know, we're thinking about actually from a um, uh, efficiency perspective and protein source of efficiency, you know, putting our pressures away from a, a, um, a livestock production system that, that is a huge consumer of that and thinking about actually, you know, should we be directly eating the, the various different types of pelagic fish like herring, mackerel, et cetera. Obviously, again, as Rachel's already alluded, we can't just put our pressures back onto one specific type of fish. It's spreading that pressure um uh, across um you know the the more sustainable sort of um uh, populations as, as best we can yeah i think i think that makes uh sense i mean like what what about trout i know obviously that's not a, a marine fish are they are they maybe better for it or is it just a case you're swapping one thing for for another so, so trout's an interesting one um, because it, it's it's produced it or the production methods can can vary hugely so for instance, um, uh, a large number of trout, especially uh, in Scotland, is, is also grown in open net pens, exactly the same as salmon farming. So uh, from a, a wild fish or, or, you know, all of the reasons that we've just been discussing, it's just as damaging as, as the salmon farming industry. That's not to say that the other production systems are, are, are certainly better. So, um, you know, the the um, uh, big benefit of, of trout production is that it, it can be done fully or the whole cycle can, can be um uh, can be done in, in freshwater systems and those freshwater systems can be the sort of land-based tank systems that we've already discussed or or land-based sort of pond systems that, that, that you know require a physical barrier between the the farmed fish 
and um, uh, you know the the, the wild uh, uh, populations of fish as, as well as the, the the local environment. So you know having to to treat the the water or effluent coming from those. So you know certainly in some respect they can be better. We would definitely um, encourage everyone to to you know do their due diligence to ensure that they're looking at which system you know trout is is coming from before sort of putting their pressures or or or, or buying farm trout for sure. Yeah, I think, and and as you've both mentioned as well, like, you know, obviously there's a lot of wild trout, but if we all ate wild trout, then there'd be no trout. So yeah, I think like you say, it's not as simple as just picking one fish. It's a case of, yeah, try and do your research, see what, uh, where the fish is coming from, how much fish you eat and, um, and do all of that. So no, I think, I think that all makes a tremendous amount of sense. Um, so obviously you've, we've talked about all these, these issues with salmon farming then how, how do salmon farms justify it are they are they denying it are they saying it's not as bad as it is or like how, how do they how do they get away with it basically it's a very good question <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i would say the salmon industry again firmly promotes its product as a sustainable product mm. whether or not it truly believes that that's the case we can't say but definitely in its kind of promotional materials it will firmly i mean it actually shies away now from from calling for the most part calling its product sustainable because it has got into some hot water about that in the last uh, couple of years but in terms of like responsibly produced and pitching it as i guess a good form of protein in comparison to other types of terrestrial farming um matt have you got anything else no i i, th I think you've covered it i think there's there's clever use of, of terminology um in terms of the production methods that that it uses and the and the, the products that it produces or that you know the product that it produces i think um you know what we're trying to to achieve with the offer table campaign is actually we're starting to dismantle some of those those um those those comments um or, or um claims by the industry and actually say uh you know that that to to produce that product it takes uh, you know the 2.5 kilos of, of wild caught fish or or you know, one in four of those fish are dying before they even get into the plate, and these are the environmental impacts of this as well. So, it, it's trying to systematically dismantle some of the claims that are being made with, you know, with evidence. So, you know, all of the claims that we're making, all the stats that we put forward, both on the website and you know, that we're discussing now, is is all backed by reports. Um, you know, either that that we produce, or in the majority, you know, being produced by the scientific community or or some of the the NGOs and community community groups that we work with. So. It's about putting that information out there, and 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 really for me, I feel like what we're trying to achieve and to to you know to to counter what's being said by the industry is is to actually take the general public below the the surface of the water because you know all that's being seen now is these images of pristine locks and you know just these circular um uh, circular hoops sat on the the water, but actually the reality is these. The, these huge nets with, with um, uh, massive environmental and welfare impacts sat underneath the surface and, 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 and taking the individual into those those cages is really important. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely the uh, the the case for sure. I mean, when I've seen arguments um, to and fro salmon farming, it can get quite heated, heated online. I'm looking forward to the backlash from uh, this. It'll <laughs> be fun for a couple of weeks online. But I, I noticed one of the things a lot of pro salmon farmers mention is about mortality rates with uh, released salmon by anglers. And it's almost like, to me, it kind of seems like you're trying to deflect, it would be my honest opinion. Obviously, I mean, I'm an angler myself, so they're like trying to, let's throw some of the heat, let's throw the anglers under the bush. But I don't know where that evidence is from or where they're pulling that from that uh, rod caught salmon are, are then dying and, and not making it. But surely they're killing way more wild fish than, than anglers ever would. I mean, but I don't I don't salmon fish very often, but... I think in the UK, salmon fishing is almost exclusively catch and release now. Very few salmon anglers take them for the pot. I think salmon anglers are some of the best conservationists out there. They realise that we need to save every salmon that we've got. So, um, and, and, and tremendously careful with what they do. So I don't know where they're plucking those facts from. Yeah, I mean, I think with regards to Scotland, as you mentioned, there is a voluntary catch and release scheme in place that has been very successful. Um, mm. In recent years, you see 95 to 99% of caught salmon being returned, 99% um, during the kind of the spring season, which is obviously um, critical for migrating smolts. Um, if it's done properly, you know, at Gilly, led by Gillies, 
catch and release does not have a huge mortality rate attached to it um from our perspective as you say like I would say this is a, a kind of misdirection in terms of a bit of a red herring to to kind of com- a red salmon. Debate, complicate issues <laughs> and to detract yeah <laughs> exactly powder in the fun yeah. detract attention away from potentially those wider issues that are impacting on salmon populations and as an organization you know we recognize that there are a number of different issues that are impacting on wild salmon populations from our perspective, salmon farming, tackling open net salmon farming is one of the big issues that we can take immediate action on. And therefore, that's why a lot of our work focuses on that as a real tangible change that we can make now. But as you say, there will always be an element of blame passing. And I think that is is an example of that. And I would just say, when you see stats like that online, look at the sources and really try to scrutinize it for yourself because you know i think that's good practice for everyone in oh, the God. society yeah. we live in I, mean, I would say particularly with regards to that it's it's important to be critical of what you're seeing definitely the the internet is dark and full of terrors is what i found and the <laughs> amount of like rubbish that people will just uh vomit an opinion and then you're like, but wh- where are you? Because again, like people just take that face value. But you're like, well, who are you and where are you getting that from? And I don't know if this is a symptom of the modern age, but it's almost like people are also um, expert phobic. And they're like, oh, well, yeah. just because you're you're a vet and you've got a degree and you actually know what you're talking about, I'm not going to listen to you. And you're like, what? What are you on yeah. about? It can be very difficult. And I, I think saying this is, you know, I've campaigned against a campaign around lots of different industries over the years and there yeah. are specific kind of tactics that are used by industries against people who are trying to raise awareness of these issues and they do include confusing the debate online yeah. through the use of social media and we've seen that happen a few times in the last couple of years so um yeah that is, is a very real and again just to go back to your initial point salmon farming sounds very quaint but this is a multi-billion dollar multi-billion pound industry um, with everything that's associated with that they're going to fight tooth and nail to protect that presumably as well so it's you know whatever tactic to to get the job um done and people might say as well like you know well why should we why should we care about the salmon why why put the focus on it and um, i was reading up some stats the other day and it's something like since the 70s global population of wild atlantic salmon have declined uh from 8 to 10 million to just 3 million today so over 50% loss in salmon in a relatively short amount of time and you know i don't want to sound scaremongering but it just keeps going down and down and down it makes you think well at what point are we going to actually step in and take some real action here because they just continue on this downward trend and we also see salmon at wild fish we see salmon as a keystone Mm. species you know as an indicator of a thriving ecosystem because if salmon can thrive in a habitat and an ecosystem then all types of wild fish will be able to thrive so it's not just worrying in relation specifically to wild atlantic salmon but all biodiversity in our waters yeah for sure i mean you look at um you look at pacific salmon and the numbers that they're in in some of the rivers and i mean i don't know if there's literal evidence or like literary evidence or things like that but presumably atlantic salmon must have been something like that in days gone by Whereas if you look, I mean, I was up in Scotland on the Spey in November, and if I found half a dozen salmon, I was jumping for joy. I was so excited just to see that small number. And it just goes to show that, you know, talking to the gillies and and, and river keepers and whatnot, they said, oh, yeah, well, you know, 30 years ago, there would have been 20 or 40 salmon there. And then, you know, X amount of time before that, there might have been 100 salmon. It's just, it's it's um shifting baseline syndrome, isn't it? You get used to to that small amount because it's been so gradual but you don't realize what we've lost and that's yeah. also like bearing in mind that until i believe it's the 90s scotland also sustained a very large netting industry mm. for wild salmon so in terms of those numbers that we're seeing you know there has been and i think the scottish government has acknowledged this there's been a buffer period where the closure of the netting industry has actually kind of obfuscated the the real numbers of salmon the true salmon numbers because obviously initially the wild returning salmon included those salmon that might have otherwise been caught so actually what we're seeing now is i think that buffer has kind of come run its course and actually the numbers that we're seeing now are are really worrying yeah and and i guess as well like 
presumably if 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 we by some miracle salmon numbers recover and they get to a sustainable number you could potentially bring back that uh that sort of netting if there are enough enough plenty you could return to taking wild stocks could you well i think a lot of the um i mean i'm not sure about that no as okay as all right no one <laughs> <laughs> but just I another point actually on, yeah. on the catch and release is obviously there are also category gradings um, okay. for rivers within scotland so i think where you are seeing salmon retrieved it will be a kind of the the cat the, the rivers that are graded exploitable by the scottish government rightly or wrongly we won't go into that today no, okay <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> No, that makes that makes sense. Well, I guess to summarise then, uh, before we go, so what are the what are the the main problems we're looking at, and then if people want to do something about it, what what can they do? Yeah, so I think the main problems we're we're looking at is that fundamentally, open net summer farming is is unsustainable. Um, the environmental impact is is huge. The welfare impact on the the farm salmon, um, uh, you know, is 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 massive as as well. And then when we think of it as, as a much bigger, you know, planet health um, uh, perspective, the sustainability and the impact that it could have on on human population as well as the the, the global health is 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 you know fundamentally unsustainable and unacceptable because of that and the direct impact that it's having on our wild fish in the UK that. You know, as we've just discussed, need that urgent protection. You know, we're calling for an end to open that salmon farming. We're asking individuals to 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 commit to not serving and, and not eating farm salmon. Um, so I think that's the message that, that that we would like to get across. I think Rachel would probably articulate it in a much better way than me. But um... no, no, I was just going to say, just adding to that, like anyone who's listening to your podcast who wants to get involved, as you say, obviously visit the off the table website, sign up to the kind of updates, but also you know, write to your supermarkets that are serving farm salmon, asking them about their sourcing practices, write to your favourite restaurants, asking them to take farm salmon off their menus. And also, if you live in Scotland, write to your MSP about this issue, because I think also on the political level, um, it's something that needs to be addressed urgently. No, I think so. And, and hopefully we've gone some way to kind of shedding a bit of light on, on salmon farming, really. So, yeah, I just want to say thanks for joining me. Matt and Rachel and coming on. Thanks, Jack. Thanks it's been for great. Having Thank us. you. Yeah.